Okay, so for the following three weeks, we're going to be doing a fascinating series, a small series about Lashona Kodesh, our holy tongue, the source of all languages. I'm going to divide it into three. So tonight, a little bit of a background about Lashona Kodesh, how it originated, how, how we have proof that the world was created in this language. Next week, I will share with you a lot of proof of how we can actually see that all the languages in the world that evolved later on actually originate from Lashona Kodesh. And we'll, talk, we'll take various examples of various languages. And the third week will actually be a more in-depth analysis of the Aleph bit, according to the Kabbalah and the actual meaning of the letters, their shapes and so forth. Also a very fascinating topic. Tonight, however, is a more, I would say, about the script, about the origins of languages, about Hebrew in its various forms. There, there's quite a bit of material scattered all over the place, but I don't think there's ever been a lecture about this, uh, describing in depth how Lashon HaKodesh has evolved, where it came from, and how we know for a fact that the Torah was given in this language. So we have a language and we have a script, and we're going to talk a little bit about both. Some of you were here when we did this, the series of the 70 most difficult questions, and we went through topics like evolution, we went through topics that have to do with creation, and you may recall the term continental drift, if you don't remember, I will be talking a little bit about this now because this will help us understand a little bit about what exactly happened. Now, if you were to read about the Hebrew script and the Hebrew language in non-Jewish sources, you're not going to get accurate information. Because from a linguistic standpoint, they will analyze things differently, trying to come up with their own ideas or, and conclusions as to how every language, every alphabet, evolved, and they will not necessarily agree, they will not all agree that Hebrew is the oldest language and the oldest Aleph bit. But soon I will demonstrate to you that we can actually prove that it is. Even though in Hazal, in Talmudic sources, there are various opinions about in which script the Luchot Abrit were written. There is, we're going to talk about that too, in the Gemara. Nevertheless, you will see from what I will show you, how things nevertheless did evolve because of a very important event that occurred in our history. And that is the event of Migdal Bavel, the Tower of Bavel, which after the flood, some peoples, Gentiles, wanted to build a very tall building. And what happened after that? The languages were all mixed up. So there's a little bit of history involved here, but if you follow closely as to how this events unfolded, you will, you will get the feel of what I'm talking about. what the Torah says in the creation of the woman. The rabbis tell us, you can see that in the creation of the woman, Adam, who's presented with his wife, calls her Isha. Why does he call her Isha? She is taken from man. And this is the only language in the world where one can say those words that a woman is called Isha because Isha comes from Ish. So the Torah itself is being written, being given in Lashona Kodesh. Otherwise, this word, this phrase would not make any sense. Isha, woman, is taken from man, and therefore the word Isha resembles 
men as well. There's an interesting discussion brought down in Jewish literature and in non-Jewish literature. What would be the language that a child will begin to speak on his own were he to be completely isolated from civilization without any contact and any exposure? After all, when we are exposed and we do hear sounds, we mimic them, right? And that is how we first learn our first language. And according to some sources that are brought down, a child will begin to speak Lashon HaKodesh. Why Lashon HaKodesh? Because Lashon HaKodesh is the language with which the world was created. It is a natural tongue that somehow is in our system or in our neshama. Whereas all other languages in the world are languages that men have agreed on. Even though languages evolve too. As we will soon see, languages have evolved as a result of time, place, and outside influences that came in to that particular region and had influence. So languages evolved. But for the most part, whether it's an alphabet or a language of some other nation, certain words were agreed upon. Otherwise, how did they start, these languages? Whereas in Lashon HaKodesh, if this is the true original language of all, the language with which the world was created, it makes some sense, possibly, that a child would somehow begin to speak words, some words of Lashon HaKodesh. Some claimed that they tried this out. There was a king, a famous British king, who made this experiment, and this is what he discovered. Others claim that the child would be mute, that it's impossible, that he would have any vocabulary. But just wanted to share with you that that is what some sources claim would happen if the child were on his own to begin to speak. He would begin to speak Lashon HaKodesh. In the very beginning, the Torah tells us, after the Mabul, after the flood, there was a universal language. Everybody spoke which language? Not Egyptian, not Sumerian. As I said earlier, if you go and read other sources, you may find all kinds of examples of languages that they claim. Nobody really knows. The Torah tells us one thing, that everybody spoke one language. There was one language. As a result of their attempt to build a big structure that will reach the heavens, Hashem was upset at them. And Hashem says, Hashem is going to come down and mix up their language, as the Midrash describes, that all of a sudden, when somebody asked for a hammer, this, the other individual brought him a brick. He asked for a brick, he brought him a hammer. In other words, all of a sudden, all, just out of the blue, their language started changing. And even though a lot of the vocabulary was the same, but it was all mixed up. Some of the vocabulary possibly changed. Some of the letters were dropped. Things started changing slowly. You did not have Chinese right away. Chinese is very, very different than Lashon HaKodesh. There, are, there were other languages between Lashon HaKodesh and Chinese. As I said earlier, and I will show you next week, in order for a language to become a language over time, if it originates from Lashon HaKodesh, and it's not an artificial language, there has to have been some sort of development. It went from one to the other, from the other one to the another one. So it could have been several generations and somehow it just became very, very different. But if you were to analyze using certain rules in linguistics, if you were, you were to analyze certain words, you will see that this is really, the root of the word is Hebrew. Not every word, because as I said before, many words were contractions. In other words, they agreed that we're going to call the days of the week, for example, so certain names that have to do with planets. So Monday has nothing to do with Yom Sheni. Right? Yom Sheni, for us, it's the second day. And they came up with another name to describe the second day of the week. So it's not always that a particular word in a language comes from Lashon HaKodesh. But as you will see, many do, many of the basic words. So Hashem is about to mix up their tongues. So what's happening over there in Bavel, 
in Babylonia after the Mabul in the year 1996 from creation. If you want to know exactly, Hashem is mixing up their languages. So this is the beginning of the involvement of all the languages in the world. And rabbis say there were 70 main families. And at that time, we need to assume that the languages resemble each other. They're not very, very different. They're not very apart because they're, they're it's just beginning. But they're enough different to have a problem in intelligibility. People understanding each other. It's bad enough that they already don't understand each other. That's where you have dialects, the same language. They may or may not understand each other depending on how distant the dialects are. It's called Babel because that is where Shem Balal. So the Torah is also telling us the name Babylonia comes from mixing the tongues. The Torah is already recording that this is where it's happening. Don't think of any other theory. Don't believe in anything else. It was intended to be like that from the very beginning. This is not to say that in the future languages cannot change. Languages are always changing. You try to read Shakespearean English today and you won't understand what he's talking about. The vocabulary change, the style, the pronunciation for sure, and we'll talk about pronunciation too. How do we know how to pronounce Lashona Kodesh according to the way it originally was pronounced? Because pronunciation is the one that's quickest affected by people moving around. But at least we know that the languages are evolving from Babylonia. Okay, now look at this. What do you see? You're seeing a globe with all the continents drifting. If you were to look closely at an atlas, at a map, you will see that the pieces actually do go together. There was a big argument about this in the past, in the science world. Did it, this really happen? Could it happen? Today, everybody's pretty much in agreement that there are tectonic plates. We have earthquakes and the various plates move around. Over time, this could happen. Now, what's the idea behind this? According to our sources, it's very possible that this occurred right before the Mabul, a little bit after the Mabul and during the Mabul, where the face of the earth changed drastically as a result of the major flood. Not only were many, many animals and human beings destroyed, but the face of the earth, the Midrash describes the canyons, the ridges, the hills. It was not such a very hilly country. It used to be one mass of earth, one continent. That is the way Hashem created the world. He does not create small bits and pieces Islands here, islands there, Hawaii, New Zealand, and Indonesia, thousands of islands. He created one mass of earth, Veteraeha Yabasha. You were able to see it. It was surrounded by waters. The whole weather was different before the Mabul. So we know a lot of things changed after the Mabul. This could have, however, happened in stages. As we're speaking, you are ha you're having islands being formed because of volcanoes in the oceans. But these are small islands. This was a major cataclysmic event that may have happened as a result of three floods. The big flood that we know called the Mabud, plus two other mini floods, if we can call them, or tsunamis of sorts, that inundated one-third or two-thirds of the globe, depending which one we're talking about. One before the Mabul and one after the Mabul. So you're having three major events that are apparently going to affect the continents. So it's possible that they drifted because of those events. Now, what happens as a result of the drifting of the continents? You have people going apart, people moving away, people becoming more and more distant from each other. As a result of that, you, of course, the language is affected. What I would like to say is that this in itself is indicative that in the same way that the continents broke up, so did the language break up. Now we know the language broke up from that event of Balal. But soon you will see the reason why I point to this event that the language broke up just in the same way as the continents broke up is because we need to know that so did Hebrew as a language and so is, did Hebrew as an alphabet break up. See, the, the fact that Hebrew broke up as an alphabet, nobody really knows. But I will show it to you why I think that's so, that is true. Even though there is some mention about it, 
Some talk about it, but nobody understands what the Gemara is really saying. Once you understand the concept of continental drift, the land breaking up, people moving around, people moving away, this is affecting at the same time the language being spoken changing. This is also affecting the Hebrew alphabet. Okay, in the very beginning, how did people write? Well, based on historians' records, based on archaeology, there was the Egyptian hieroglyphics. You've heard of hieroglyphics? Images, images depicting all kinds of ideas. Some images even depicting certain sounds. This is what they used. In the very, very beginning, everybody pretty much is in agreement that these were the medium of communication among certain civilizations. Not just Egyptians used the, the pictograms or the hieroglyphics. This does not mean, however, that Hebrew did not exist at the time. Hebrew as a script, we will soon see, existed from the very, very beginning. But the nations of the world are not privy to it. It does not belong to them. It belongs to the Jewish people. It will eventually belong to people called the Jews. But the script of it was there. But the Egyptians became a separate civilization in a separate continent that formed called Africa and needed a way of communication. There were the Sumerians and other nations in the Middle East that came up with something called the cuneiform writing system, which was also some sort of pictures. It was not real letters, but it was much closer to an alphabet, even though there were many, many symbols to describe sounds and so, and so forth, and, and letters. So the, we do know from the discoveries that were made in those areas way back then that these were old forms of alphabets. Where did they come from? Well, they were made up. You could say that others later on came from this. But these were, from the very beginning, pretty original cre creations. In other words, these were agreed upon. You even have languages that are used today that are... Somebody sat down and said, this is going to be an A and this is going to be a B. Anybody know which languages? Which alphabets? No, today... Languages that somebody recently sat down and decided that this is going to be the alphabet, pretty recently. Korean, relatively new. Gruzini, from Georgia. These are la relatively, somebody sat down not too long ago, a few hundred years ago, tops, and decided, either he was the king or whatever, this is going to be our alphabet, without regard to others. He may have copied certain ideas. So languages, alphabets, many parts of, of the language and alphabet were composed by human beings, just like these. And then we, of course, we have the familiar Chinese. Japanese is a little bit different, but Japanese also uses some Chinese symbols. There's three writing scripts in Japanese. This is the more complex one, but the Chi and even the Chinese have something called the simplified Chinese. Chinese also evolved and there's a whole chokhmah, there's a whole science to putting together a pictogram depicting a house. Many of the old symbols in Chinese, by the way, did come close to resemble what they were talking about. But today, you look at something that is supposed to be a house, and there may be something of a house in there, but otherwise it's very difficult to figure it out. And there are thousands of such symbols. It's not easy to become literate in Chinese. It takes many, many years, you know. And imagine a dictionary, thousands of pages, volumes, just putting all these symbols together. But many of these symbols are also ideograms. In other words, they convey ideas, some convey sounds, and some, of course, depict all sorts of things. So this is a kind of... I guess we can call it pictogram alphabet. It's not a real alphabet composed only of 22 letters like the Lashona Kodesh. It's, it's much more, so it's not a real alphabet. But this is old. Okay, getting back to our part of the world, Israel and the surrounding areas, 
we have various alphabets. Now, pay close attention to these ones because that's more important than the Chinese. Here, the, the linguists are describing the old alphabets of the area as proto knanite Phoenician and Greek. Phoenicians lived in that area, what is today known as Lebanon. Canaanites, I think most of you know Eretz Canaan, the peoples who lived in that land, in that region before the Jews arrived, and Greek. If you pay close attention, if you look at them, you will see that they resemble somewhat each other. They are related. They how, somehow evolved from each other. So you're having an old script that looks a little bit like Greek evolve, and everybody agrees they evolved. And there was a, a, a second generation, third generation of the same kind of script, including the he old Hebrew script. The old Hebrew script is about to be formed as a result of these scripts that are there now. This is where the, go the, the historians make a mistake. They're saying, you see, these were there before, they came before Hebrew, and Hebrew came from them. Whether it's the old Hebrew script and even the new Hebrew script, which is much more square, right? And I'm going to say that it's just the opposite. What I'm saying is, based on that continental drift idea that everything broke up, no, Hebrew was first. And just like the language, the Hebrew language became modified, broken up, whatever you want to call it, into Aramaic, into Akkadian, into Sumerian, into all the various Aramaic dialects and languages of the area, and they resemble each other and eventually Arabic. In the same way that that language drifted and corrupted itself, so did the alphabet break up. So here you have what they call the Old Hebrew script. I call it Aramaic because it was used with the Aramaic language. And you have over here on the side, you have the Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav. You basically have all the letters. Now you would not recognize them unless you were looking at a coin from the Second Temple era. Bar Kochva, unless you're reading some of the letters that the Jews used then to communicate with each other. This is script is not familiar to you because it's not being used today except by the Samaritans. The Samaritans have a script that's very similar to this. They go back then to that period of time where they retained this script and this script was actually used for many, many years, especially during the Second Temple era. Now, even during the First Temple era, it was used. And I'm going to tell you soon what was the difference between the First Temple era and the Second Temple era. There was a, a big change occurred. But this is a script that the Jews have been using for a long time. After the destruction of the Temple, and even in the Second Temple era itself, they are already using the regular script that we have. Nevertheless, letzorche hol, for secular things, this language, this script, I should say, is still being used for Hol, not for Kodesh. If you took a look at some of them, you may actually see the corruption of an older Hebrew letter. Because that's what I'm trying to say, that, that this in reality is not something new. Of course, it could be a new generation of what was there before. But if you look at the very first one all the way on the top, look at the very first one at the left. Do you all see it from here? That's an Aleph. Doesn't that look like the Aleph of today even that we have? Just move the bar away. That bar, that's gone, right? Just move it on the side, right? Round out that angled picture, whatever it is, right? And then but you basically have an Aleph. And you can do that with all the letters. Here you have a comparison of the old and the new script. The bottom is called Ktav Stam, which I'm going to explain soon, or Ktav Meruba, the square. And the top one is the old Ivrit. Ivrit, what does Ivrit, what does the word Ivrit come from? Me'ever Anahar, from the other side of the river. That is where all the people came from. That is where even Abraham came from. So they're using an old script way back then. And they're calling it Ivrit. 
But that's not the Ivrit of today. In various archaeological finds, they have found coins, manuscripts, stones, where they were able to date, they were able to date them through carbon-14 and other methods of dating, and they were able to see which script was used at what period of time in our history. So there's no doubt that the Jewish people for many, many years were using the old Hebrew script, which was called Ktav Ro'etz, Ktav Libona, different words. And the word Ro'etz does seem to be describing a broken kind of script, not a clean cut script, which basically fits with what I'm trying to say. It's broken because originally it was intact and then it broke. And then, of course, we have Arabic, the Arabic script that is, is being used in Persian, being used in Urdu, being used in Pashto, being used in various languages in the Middle East and in Asia. And it was even used for Turkish up until recently. A script that is also somewhat old. But if you were to look closely at the letters, they're also parts of the original Hebrew or the original Ivri script, but with some modifications. What are these modifications? These are not just modifications as a result of time. These are also modifications as a result of script. Script as opposed to writing square letters. Hebrew today has script. English has script. Various languages have a script. In other words, a different way of writing a letter other than just square block letters. So Arabic is becoming a, a, an alphabet that at the same time that it's evolving as a language, it's also evolving as a script. Even though Arabic does have individual block letters, it lends itself very easily to what's called in linguistics ligatures. Ligatures meaning that you can easily connect one letter with another letter very easily. And, but if you looked closely at this script, you will recognize the old script too. It's just another generation of the old. What Arabic has and what a couple other languages have, including Lashon HaKodesh, is of course a system of vowels. The system of vowels that we use, the Patah, the Segol, the Tzere, the Cholam, which we'll, maybe we'll talk about more uh, two weeks from now, that did not exist in the very beginning. English is a language where letters form the vowels A, E, I, O, U. These are letters, just like any other letter. But in Hebrew, and in Arabic too, because Arabic comes from Hebrew, right? They used symbols on top or on the bottom of the letter to give you a sound. So you have the same letter, the B, the top one is B. You can call it B, Ba, Bu, depending what symbol you put on top or on the bottom. And the same is true in Farsi, the same is true in other languages that use the Arabic script. They use sounds, and these sounds, of course, came about later, just like by us, it came about later in history, not in the very, very beginning. The vowel system that we use today is called the Tveria system of vowels. There's a Tveria school of grammar where they put together the various rules of Dikduk of Lashon HaKodesh, and during the Talmudic era is when they decided which symbols they're going to use and, of course, what they represent. Now, in Hebrew, besides these symbols of vowels, you also have other symbols, which we'll see soon. The symbols of Tamea Mikra, how to sing the, the Pesukim of the Torah. Here you have the entire alphabet called Stam. Now, Stam is called Stam because this is the alphabet that's used, the script that's used to write Sefer Torah, Tefillin, Mezuzot. So if you see the word Stam in abbreviation, that's what it stands for. This is the script, that, can, and this is the only script that we can use today for the Sefer Torah to be 100% kasher, even though actually, technically, it could be written in the older script too, but this is the script that we use. Now, this... If you look at this, you will say, well, 
my mezuzah doesn't look exactly like that. Look at the hey, look at the aleph. If you really look closely and you understand what the, what the letters should look like, you can say, wait a minute, but mine was not written exactly like that. It looks 90% like that, but not exactly like that. What's the difference? Well, here's a chart of the vowels. What the difference between the various letters is that you have Sfaradim and Ashkenazim. And even amongst Ashkenazim, you have various customs, depending what part of Europe they came from. The script also evolved somewhat, but for the most part it retained what it has to retain for it to be 100% kasher. So a little bit of flexibility is allowed for style. It was always allowed. But Kabbalistically, what the letter needs to look like in form is what we'll see two weeks from now is this particular ktav that has many, many details to it. This particular script has many, many details to it that represent all kinds of ideas and a lot of information on the Kabbalistic level is embedded in every letter. So it is possible to have some slight modification as long as the shape and form of the letter is there. A quick example of some additional information that you may see on certain letters of the alphabet is called tagim. Tagim are crowns. Look at the crown of the yud, the bottom one and the top one. You see the yud? You recognize the yud, but you will only see the crown sticking up on top and the crown sticking a little bit at the bottom of the head of the yud on the mezuzah and sefer. In other words, where this is very important and critical. Some of these details, if they're missing from a mezuzah, it's pasul. And now you can understand and appreciate why a small mezuzah is so hard to write properly for it to be 100% kasher. How could you do all these little details to such a small letter? But all of this is part of our tradition. We have an old tradition of all these details of what the letters need to look like from the very, very beginning. Here you have the names and some of the symbols of the Ta'ameh Amikra. According to the Ashkenazim, they're called a little bit different than what the Sfaradim call them. For the most part, what they represent are stops. They help like punctuation in the Torah, commas, periods, and help us understand sometimes the context of what we're saying, what we're reading. But they're also tunes and the tunes of Sfaradim and Ashkenazim and Temanim, Italians and even Moroccans are somewhat different because tunes and melodies were always things that were that depended on the location, things that that were modified over time, things that came with time that did not exist in the beginning. When the Torah is being given it's not necessarily being given in a, with a particular tune tunes in whether it's in prayer tunes whether it's in how we read the torah and shabbat or the aftara or shira shiri that came about with time was developed and because faradim and ashkenazim and temanim live pretty far apart they developed their own melodies and their own tunes for how to read that's okay that's acceptable that's part of the galut that's not contradictory and it's not a problem whatsoever but these symbols, and these are the names of the symbols, are there for also to tell us how to sing it, how to emphasize it, how to read it. Okay, so we saw how Lashon Kodesh originally looked in the old form called Ktav Yigvri. However, there was a second Ktav called Ktav Ashuri that I'm going to talk a little bit more at length very, very soon. What we don't know is which one came first yet, because historically, if you follow the non-Jewish sources, they will tell you Ktav Ivri was always there from the very beginning. This Ktav Ashuri, the square Ktav that the Jews have in use today, is somehow came about later, and they even try to prove it from the Gemara. So we're going to discuss the timing of this script soon, which one is the real, why do we use that today, not use the other one, and so forth. But in the meantime, I want to just share with you what happened to all the Ktav, whether it was Ktav Ashuri, whether it was 
Arabic, whether it was English. Eventually, there was a development of script. In other words, many, many languages have a handwritten script, including Hebrew. And why am I sharing this with you? Because you may be curious, oh, when did this begin? This was not there in the very beginning. If you went back to the time of the Bet HaMikdash, there wasn't a real script. They wrote pretty much in square letters. But little by little, a script did develop. It was just natural for it to develop. People wrote quickly. That's what shorthand is all about, right? So you're having a script that little by little is also changing, and you can actually trace the changes, and you can see the differences in the script from country to country. So what you have over the years, at least in the past thousand years, you're having a clear difference between Ashkenazi and Sephardic script. The script that today we write Hebrew with is the Ashkenaz script that only developed in Europe in the past few hundred years. It's not old at all. The script that we use today for Hebrew, not at all. And people have different styles slightly, but basically we all use that script, the Ashkenazi script. So you may wonder, what script did the Rambam use? He was Sephardic. What script did the Bet Yosef use? What script did the Sephardic Jews script? They did not use Ashkenazi script. Look at the handwriting, if you can, of Rabbi Kaduri, Zechet Tzadik Levracha. He did not use Ashkenazic script. What did he, anybody know what they used? What's that? What you see here is what they call the cursive script of the Ashkenazim. I added at the very bottom the signature of the Baal Shem Tov, who lived over 250 years ago. You can see he's using Ashkenazic script to sign his name. So now we're even having a signature come up. Fancy signatures. There was one big rabbi who, whose signature looked like a boat. You know why? Because he had a big miracle. He was saved from a, in the ocean from drowning. So from that point on, his name took the shape of a boat. <laughs> so anyway, so this is the Ashkenazi script. Here's the Sephardic script. The Sephardic script resembles what we call today the Rashi script. So if you look at all Sephardic documents, script, you will find something that resembles closely the Rashi script. Now what's Rashi script? Now everybody knows what Rashi script is? That's the script you see in the letters of Rashi. But Rashi didn't write it in that way. There's a lot of books that use that font, that gufan, that kind of script. But it's called Rashi script. Why? Here's the Rashi script. Looks similar to the regular script, but it's different. Where did this come about? When they were coming to the time when they were going to print books, printing, no more handwriting, they used the fonts that we have today, the regular Hebrew script, right? To write the Torah, to publish the Torah, to publish the Gemara, right? they had to decide what other shape of letter to use for commentaries that are not the re real text. We have the Ramban, or Chaim, Rashi. We have commentaries on the Torah. We have commentaries on the Gemara. In order to distinguish between one script and the other, they chose this old Sephardic script. Why did they call it a Rashi script? Rashi didn't use the script for himself. It wasn't around even during his time. Why they called it a Rashi script? Because the majority of the commentaries that we have on the Torah and the Gemara is Rashi. So in his honor, it's called Rashi script. That's all. Rashi did not use the script. The script was not even around back then. It eventually evolved from an old Sephardic script. And this is what they used for the commentaries. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the script that was used in the Torah. All right, we spoke about the old Hebrew script. I showed you what the script looks like today. It would be nice to know in what script was the Luchot written. 
the Luchot Abrit, the tablets. In what script did Moshe Rabbeinu write to, to write the first Sefer Torah? So first, we need to look at the Pesukim that say as follows. When Hashem finished speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu, he gave him the two tablets, the first ones. They were Luchot Even, out of stone. They were written by Hashem Himself. The first tablets by Hashem Himself. They were miraculous. There was something miraculous about them. They were the handiwork of Hashem. But here is a, here is the key words. The Michtav, Michtav Elohim Hu Harut Aluchot, and the handwriting, the script, the style of the writing was Michtav Elohim. This was not just any alphabet that was being used at the time. This was God's alphabet, Hashem's alphabet, Michtav Elohim. And he did not use Egyptian hieroglyphics, right? He did not use cuneiform. He did not he, he used his own and he had his own. How do we know he had his own? Well, look at what it says in Pirkei Avot. In Pirkei Avot it says, Shabbat. There were ten things that were created Erev Shabbat Ben Hashem Ashot, during twilight, which means right at the end of creation, right before Shabbat sets in, a few things that Hashem, for, for some reason, put at that point in time. And I'm not going to go through all of them, just the last ones. The tablets and the writing and the tool used to writing, the, the script of the Torah. So what we see from this Prikei Avot Mishnah is that the style, the alphabet, the Ktav and the Mikhtav of the Luchot was already there from the very beginning of creation. Hashem already had it in place. He created it. He made it. The Ktav, the alphabet, the alphabet that we have today is Hashem's alphabet. And it was there from the very, very beginning. That does not mean they used it from the very beginning, but it was created and it was around from the very beginning. And if it was used partially by Adam Arishon or by the few first few generations, it may have become corrupted during the time of Dora Palaga, during the time of, Dora, of, of Migdal Bavel, when the, everybody split, the languages are becoming corrupted, so is the script that originally existed becoming corrupted, the letters are. The language is still being spoken. Lashona Kodesh is the first language being spoken, but other languages are evolving too. So the question is, why is this language called Ashur, Why is this script called Ashurit? This Ktav that we use is, kta, is called Ktav Ashuri. That's where the, the problems begin. That's where the various opinions in the Gemara begin to, to take shape because it's called Ashuri. And Ashuri reminds us of Assyria. Ashur. So some say, you know why it's called Ashuri? It came from Assyria. And anybody that reads it without thinking too much says, oh, you see, I told you so. This was not there from the very beginning. This eventually evolved. It was not even the Jews' script. It belonged to the Assyrians. Mapitom Shtuyot has nothing to do with that. Just because it's called Ktav Ashuri, and even if you say Ashuri means Assyria, it does not mean it belonged to the Assyrians, not necessarily. It does not even mean that it developed with time and other alphabets came before. Not necessarily. The main idea behind the word Ashuri, if you call it Assyrian, is Sha'ala imahem me'ashur, as the Gemara says, Ulama nikra Ashurit, Sha'ala. It came with the Jews from Ashur. The Jews went to Babel. They went to, in, to exile to Babylonia. They came back with the script. Ezra HaSofer, as, a, as of the Second Temple era, telling brothers and sisters, from now on, we're going to be using this Ktav Ashuri. Up until now, they were using Ktav Ivri, the old one, that looked like Greek. And now... At least for Kodesh, for writing Sifret Torah, we are going to be using that. That is a fact. As of, as of the time they're coming back to rebuild it, they're still using the old script for Hol, for letters, communication. But for Kodesh, Sifret Torah, and eventually Sidurim, everything will be Ktav Ashuri. Why is it called Ashuri? One explanation, it came with them from Ashur. Coming does not mean it belonged to Ashur, does not mean that, that it was there all the time. It just means 
that as soon as they're coming home, they're using the script that was with them and belonged to them, and they knew about it all the time, all along, they just didn't use it. And why didn't they use it? So the Gemara explains because of their sin, Heta Egel, when the Luchot, first sets of Luchot broke, their alphabet also, in a sense, broke. Or they were no longer given permission to use that holy script. So there's no doubt that for a long time they were using the old Hebrew script because of that sin. But they have it with them. That script was there from the very beginning. And it's brought down, and I, I just have here on the screen various other quotations from other commentaries that also pretty much emphasize this point that uh, this script came with them and how did they know that it was time for them to use the script? For those of you who ever read Daniel, there's an interesting passage there, an incident, where the king of Babel all of a sudden is frightened by seeing a hand of an angel writing something on the wall. That's what they take the English expression. Don't you see the handwriting on the wall? It's from Daniel. The Malach is writing some cryptic words in a language, in a script that they never saw before. In the Hebrew that we use today. In the script that we use today, he's writing that your time is up. You're a goner. That's basically what he told him. Only Daniel knew how to read that script. Or at least only he knew how to put the words together and understand and interpret them. But that script was the script of Ashuri being used. Not the old Hebrew script, which was still being used by the Jews. Ezra Sofer understood, that all the Chachamim understood that time has come, Baruch Hashem, that we are now able to use this script that always existed, and this is the real script. Ashuri also means beautiful. It means various other things too. In the Gemara, you will see a machloket, various opinions as to what was written with which script. Let me basically just tell you the conclusion. We know that at least, at the very least, the first set of Luchot were written in Ketav Ashuri, according to most opinions. The first set of Luchot that were from Hashem. The second ones, remember, Moshe is writing. The first set of Luchot, at least, they were for sure with Ketav Ashuri. <clears throat> we do know that the language that was being used during the first temple era was Lashon Kodesh with the old Hebrew script. That we do know. We do know in the second temple era that they were given permission to use Ketav Ashuri and they were using Aramaic as a language because that's what they came from Babylonian speaking. That was the lingua franc of the Middle East during the entire Second Temple era. But at some point, Amisa said, we want not only the Ketav Ashuri as our alphabet, we also want Lashon Kodesh as our alphabet. At least for Torah, for, for Pesukim, for things Bikdusha, that's what they wanted to use. But that took time. Lashon HaKodesh did not become a spoken language amongst the Jews until after the Hurban Bayit Sheni. The Mishnah is already being written only in Lashon HaKodesh, but the Gemara has still mixtures of Aramaic and Lashon HaKodesh. There's a lot of portions, pure Aramaic. There is Lashon HaKodesh, which is not 100% pure Lashon HaKodesh. It has mixtures of Aramaic and other languages. And eventually Arabic comes into the scene. So Jews begin to speak Arabic. But at least we're seeing a change towards the Ketav Ashuri in the Second Temple era, and eventually also Lashon HaKodesh. So even though you do have various opinions in the Gemara as to what was written, how, we do know that eventually Ketav Ashuri became our, our alphabet, even though they were still using Ketav Ivri, the old script, for Chol, for letters and the like. Here you have pretty much uh, the breakdown of what the Gemara writes about what, how it happened, that in the very beginning they did have the Ketav Ashuri, but as a result of their sin, their, their script was broken down. And that is how I, I, that's how I pretty much figured that if this is being called a Ketav that is breaking down as a result of their sin, it could be that just like it broke down for the nations of the world in the very beginning, now it is breaking down for the Jews, and they are adapting a script that is similar to the Ketav Ashuri, but it's, it's broken. 
In other words, it's not a necessarily a script or alphabet that was taken from other nations. It is their own, but it was modified. It existed once, it was modified, and now they're taking it because they don't have permission to use the Holy Script. This is also another commentary that explains that the word harut ala luchot means that the original Hebrew was being used for the luchot because many of the letters were in a miraculous way. The way they were written was a miraculous way. And in order for them to be written in such a miraculous way, it could only have been the old script and not any other script. You could not apply what the rabbis tell us in a miraculous way, Maseni seem to any other Ktav, unless you're talking about the original uh, letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So there's more evidence that we have that the Luchot, when it says Harut ala Luchot, that they were engraved in the tablets, we're talking about the real Hebrew alphabet that we have today. And that, that, that's pretty much what is said here too. Maral Miprag also brings down that that's the meaning of Ktav Ashuri and where it comes from as a result of that angel writing what he wrote on the wall. That is when they knew and they understood that the time has come to change the, the alphabet. So when they came back from Assyria to rebuild the second temple, they started using that uh, alphabet. Here you also have the Gemara that tells us that the Mem and Samach were in a miraculous way written on the Luchot. In order for them to be written in a specific way, it had to be the original Mem and Samach. And last but not least, you will be amazed at the following discovery that somebody has discovered very recently, and the, there's a whole lecture just about this, they have taken sonograms and all kinds of methods to measure sound and see what they can depict. In other words, what kind of a shape or form does a letter f form when you utter the sound? It happens in no other language except in the Hebrew language that when you say B, this is the letter that comes out. You actually see the shape and form of the bed. Can everybody see it? What you see on the left is, is the original uh, diagram of the sound, of how it, it uh, emanates or how, it, how the waves appear. But that is eventually transformed to another method of measuring the angles and depicting it in some sort of picture. And this is the picture that comes out as a result of that pronunciation. And they've shown that with many, many letters of the alphabet. The reason I say many, not all, is because some letters apparently they're not pronouncing correctly. They don't know how to pronounce it the way they originally did. And that is possibly why it's not coming out exactly as sharp as it's supposed to. But in reality, this is an incredible discovery if it turns out to be true, and which apparently it is, to prove to us that Lashon HaKodesh is the only language in the world which was given to us by Hashem, which is not only in, in its written form a holy language, but even in the way it sounds, you can see the sound. And that is exactly what is insinuated in the words of the Torah, that Kol Ha'am Ro'im Et HaKolot. When Hashem gave the Ten Commandments, it says something very, very cryptic. And everybody was seeing the sounds. How do you see sounds? You usually hear sounds. Amisel saw the sounds. What did they see? Somehow their experience was so incredible that they were able to see something, not just hear something. And today, with some of the technology that they have today, they have demonstrated that here, sure enough, we also can see all the letters. Incredible, fascinating. But the Zat Hashem will continue in the next couple of weeks to see how all the languages, in fact, did evolve from Lashon HaKodesh. And very, very soon when Mashiach comes, guess what? 
we're all going to go back to Lashon HaKodesh. No more Telugu, no more Tagalog, no more uh, Hindi, no more Bengali, no more, no more Mongolian, no more Igbo, no more Hausa, no more Swahili, and no more Farsi either. Yeah. No more any of the, none of the languages. They will all call him by the same name. They will all know him by the same name. Very soon.